Let's go. Let's see if we get white. We do. Against Ayoi from Greece. All right. Let's see what we get in the opening. We go E4. <laughs> Excellent. I was selfishly hoping we would get an Alipin, and we do. E6. Okay. So E6 is a second tier move. It is considered by many to be sort of the third best option. I would say by most uh, to be the third best option after the two main moves. Of course, d5 is one and knight f6 is the other. And e6 has an interesting property in that after we play the move d4, which is obviously white's next move, black can allow a transposition to an advanced French. Like if we play d4 and then black plays d5. Black has to be okay with white going going e5, and that is a direct transposition to the advanced variation of the French defense. And I'll show you the actual way that it transposes afterward. Now, you might say, but from white's perspective, what if I don't play the advance against the French? And there is an alternative to the movie five for players like that. Like, I don't play the advanced French, and we don't, I don't recommend it in the speed run. So if our opponent plays d5, which he just did, we have a totally viable alternative. In fact, this alternative is recommended in the sort of Alapin Bible that I've been using to educate uh, myself and everybody else about the proper theory. And of course, the move uh, is e takes d5. We just take the pawn on d5. I think white is considered to be slightly better in the resulting position. Black takes back with the queen, which is interesting. This transposes to a position that could also occur if black would play the main move d5. Okay, if black plays d5 here, we take it. The queen takes, we play d4. And in that position, black can't play the move e6. And then presumably we would play knight f3. And we would reach exactly the same position from the game, assuming that we would play knight f3 here, which we will. Of course, the alternative is to take back with the e pawn. That frequently reaches uh, an isolated queen pawn structure. I'll talk a little bit about the theory behind that variation after the game, and I'll show you how white achieves a small but very pleasant advantage. Queen takes d5 is an entirely different kettle of fish. The pawn structure is totally different, and this move has, as this line has nothing to do with e takes d5. They could not be less related. Okay, so next step, of course, is to develop our knight to f3. This is a move we know we want to play. And black plays knight f6. I love facing this line because my recommendation against it is rather sexy, if I may say so myself. Does anybody know what my recommended move is against knight to f6? This is an incredibly dangerous move. This is a move that can, can yield a quick victory if black is not precise, but you should also not play this move in the hope that you get a quick win. That should not be your only goal in playing this move, but there's nothing wrong with playing tricky lines if you don't sacrifice on objective quality. This move happens to be one of those rare lines where it is A, incredibly dangerous, and B, even if black plays the best moves, you are still fighting quite seriously for an advantage. And I'm talking about the move knight to a3. As many of you are indicating, this is impressive. A lot of you know this move. Now, I've talked about this idea before in the, con in, in the general context of the Alapin. We might have even faced this line before. Knight a3 is a typical Alapin developing move. The knight is obviously heading for b5. And what makes this maneuver you know, probable in the Alapin is the fact that black often has the queen on d5, which is on a forkable square. So, so knight b5 comes with the tremendous threat of knight c7, but that's not the only path that the knight can take, and our opponent responds correctly with a6. There is another path that the knight can take, and in fact, we will take this path because black has prevented knight b5. The moment a6 is played, a different forkable square becomes available, and that's the b6 square. So we want to play knight a3 to c4. This is better than going bishop to c4. Because after bishop c4, the knight starts complaining and saying, hey, you you've taken away my only aggressive square. And then you're going to have to tuck the knight away on c2. And that's not particularly appealing. Also, the bishop on c4 can later on be easily chased away by the move b7, b5. So it's a classic one move itis. Knight c4 is a much more sustainable variation. And there's a lot of theory 
in this position. There, there's a lot to know here, but let's see what our opponent chooses. The best move for black, to my knowledge, is knight b8 to d7, developing and protecting the, b, the b6 square. But a lot of people here, I think most people online, they tend to drop their queen back to d8. Of course, uh, conceivably, black could also blunder the fork and play a move like b5 and just sort of assume that we're trying to drop the knight back to e3. But let's see. By the way, although black has sidestepped the sort of first category of tricks, where often black just automatically takes on d4, and after knight b5, the position becomes extremely dangerous. But we're not out of tricks yet. Queen d8, okay. So that, that's, I think, what we mostly face. So let me think about this for a second. I'm trying to remember myself what the, what the move is here. Huh. Okay, let's think about this. Okay. I think we should keep developing our pieces. And I think the important thing to understand here is that b5 in and of itself is not a dangerous move. If black plays b5, our knight has a very nice spot, parking spot in the center on e5. And remember that if black bites off more than they can chew, this a6 b5 construction, if you play the Rui Lopez, this is true in a lot of openings, can be targeted with the response a2 a4, chipping away at black's pawn chain. And when your opponent pushes a lot of pawns without pieces supporting them, attacking the pawn chain with your own pawns can be an incredibly effective way of causing your opponent's position to collapse. So the upshot is that we are not afraid of black playing b5. We can safely continue developing our pieces. So let's identify a piece that can be nicely developed. I'm looking at the dark squared bishop. Generally, my preference is to develop the side of the board on which you're going to castle so that you don't keep your king in the center for too long. Where should the bishop go? Well, between e2 and d3, it seems to me that d3 is the more active square because black is probably going to castle kingside one day, and we want to be aiming at that h7 pawn. Also, I don't love the fact that the queens are staring at each other. I want to have the power to take the pawn on c5, which we're very likely to do, by the way, and not have to worry about a queen trade. White is more actively developed here, so all things held equal, a queen trade would be in black's favor. It would diminish some of our pressure. Bishop e7, our opponent also develops. Another... Nice little byproduct of bishop d3 is that now we can play the move d takes e5 and we can win a tempo. I'm not saying we will play that move, but if we do, we, we essentially force the dark squared bishop to move two times. It just moved out to e7, and then it will have to move again to recapture the pawn. This is a common trick also in the queen's gambit uh, decline. I'll show you a different application of the same idea where you wait for your opponent to develop a piece and then you capture a certain pawn that can be recaptured by the piece that just developed. Okay, let's continue developing. Obviously, we should castle. We should get our king out of the center first and foremost. And again, we're not spending a tempo on the move a4, which would be a totally viable positional move. We might even play it if black castles, but I'm, I'm really not concerned about b5. In, in a way, I want black to play b5 because it's so, so weakening. Okay, we've got many ways in which we could fight for the advantage here. Black's position, I will say, is a lot more dangerous than it seems. I think we're only a couple of moves away, potentially, from developing a decisive attack. So, what do I see when I look at this position? Well, we should begin by identifying sort of our area of superiority. Why is white better here? Where are we going to try to attack? Well, there's sort of two areas that I'm looking at. The first is, of course, the king side. Our bishop is aiming at h7. We've got the precursor for some Greek gift ideas. We've got a knight that can hop into g5. Our queen, of course, later on can move into h5. So we've got a lot of pieces that, in the right circumstances, could quickly launch into a kingside attack. Black, on the other hand, is quite deficient developmentally speaking. You know, none of Black's queenside pieces are out. Furthermore, the bishop on c8 is hemmed in by his own pawn on e6. So what do we know about playing in a situation where you are developed a lot more actively and you have a lead in development. What is the sort of general prescription in those situations? Well, the first step is often to open the center. That's what we're taught. When you open the center, the effect of better development is easier to exploit and to transform into a direct attack or initiative. So from the sort of principled approach, the move that I would be thinking about here 
is just to play D, not D5. Well, D5 blunders the pawn, but I think we should just take on C5. And I think we should open the D file. I think we should open the D file and then quickly try to get a rook to that file in order to start creating threats against Black's passive pieces, and in particular, Black's queen. So I think it's a perfect opportunity to take on C5, open up the center, and try to use that open center to really press on Black before he's able to complete his development. Now, what's the best way of getting a rook to d1? Where should we put our queen? This is perhaps a counterintuitive question. Some of you might say, oh, let's put it on c2 and let's build a battery against the h7 pawn. Remember, a battery where the queen is in front of the bishop is a lot more effective. When the bishop is in front of the queen, it's just toothless, right? Because all this battery would be doing is attacking h7. The queen would be hamstrung by the bishop. It doesn't make any sense. Right? Like, Steph Curry should be handling the ball, not freaking, you know, I'm trying to think of a Warriors player who most people on YouTube will know. Some, you know, bench player. The queen should be in front, which means what we should do here is play queen d1 to e2. Now, you might look at this and say, am I crazy? Queen e4 is not possible. The knight defends that square. But we're doing things for the long run. You don't make every move just because on the next move, you want to achieve your main idea. The knight might eventually leave f6. In fact, we might force it out of f6 because presumably we're going to develop the dark squared bishop to g5 and the move queen e4 is something we definitely want to keep in our pockets also the queen on e2 is just generally a good piece it's just in the center pieces in the center are good so queen e2 is a lot more dangerous for black than queen c2 knight bd7 okay our opponent is playing well i think that we should complete our developing well our idea with rook to d1 Alternatively, we could also bring our bishop out first. We could play bishop f4 or bishop g5. But I don't see a reason for us to commit. I think we should start with rook d1. That's just a great move because it x-rays the queen and it puts more pressure in the center. Queen c7, okay. Our opponent is not, not breaking under that pressure. Well, now I think is the perfect opportunity for us to complete our development and play the move bishop to g5 and put pressure. I'm using that word a lot, but that's what we're doing. Put pressure on the knight on f6. So let's get our bishop out to g5. And one idea that you should sort of keep in your mental directory of ideas is to maneuver the bishop back to g3, bishop h4 and bishop g3. You might associate that maneuver with necessity, right? When your opponent plays h6, which by the way is not unlikely, although probably a mistake, you kind of go there because you have to. Here, we would go there because we want to. And because that queen on c7 is out of good squares. But our opponent plays b5. Where should the knight go? Well, we already know where the knight should go. We've already talked about this, and there's no reason for us to deviate. The knight, of course, should move to e5. Just because black has a knight on d7 doesn't mean we change our plans. Knight takes e5, knight takes e5. We have enough defenders on that square. And notice that if that trade happens, we will then be threatening to take the knight on f6 and force black to recapture with a pawn, which could be a precursor to some sort of checkmating idea. Our queen could then move into g4 or to h5 or to e4, potentially. So I think our pressure has reached kind of an apex and we should start looking very actively for tactics. I think black can defend, but it's not easy. Like, you know, a GM here with black would definitely find the way to defend, but when you put this amount of pressure on, you know, someone in the 16, 1700 range, as we've discussed many times, blunders tend to creep in in these types of situations. Yeah, blunders happen precisely when there's a lot to keep track of and you start getting overwhelmed. And this is the style of play that I'm advocating, but our opponent is not buckling under pressure. This is very good stuff by Black. Okay, so what we are going to have to do is convert our advantage, right? We put all this pressure in the center, but I think our opponent has played this perfectly. There is a tactic available in this position as a consequence of which we win a pawn. Not only do we win a pawn, we force the game into an end game. And this might not seem like the, you know, sexiest alternative imaginable, but this is just what you do when your opponent plays well. You can't always get everything you want all the time. Now, we start by trading knights on d7. Knight takes d7. And actually, we're not going to rush into this tactical operation because, yes, this wins a pawn, but this also 
uh, gives up the bishop pair, so it's not all totally one-sided. As you might notice, the rook is X-raying the knight. The knight is what's called a type 2 undefended piece, which means it's only protected by one other piece. You should still be paying attention to it. Yeah, this is a classic idea. Bishop takes h7, then queen e2 to d3, and we pick up the knight, and as a result, we're up a pawn. The, the issue, though, is that if we do that, if you keep calculating, right, bishop h7, oh, I can't draw that arrow, king h7, queen d3, let's say the king moves back, we take the knight. After the trade, black has the bishop pair, and black's bishop are, bishops are very well placed. So I would say that white is slightly better in that endgame, but if black plays well, you know, they should be able to hold the draw. Now there's another option here from white's perspective, which is to go bishop back to h4, the move that I indicated before. And still this idea of traveling to g3 with the bishop can be quite effective because the queen has to keep contact with the knight. And if we move our bishop away from g5, there are some Greek gift sacrifice ideas. So bishop h4 would be a viable alternative. But I think it is more consistent with our general strategy to play bishop takes h7 check. I think we should play it just because it signifies a nice payoff to our middle game play. This is like the natural conclusion of the way in which we've played the middle game. Might not be what you're looking for, but you have to know how to win endgames up a pawn. All right? You can't win every game with a middle game attack, and neither can I. So we're going to try to convert that pawn in that resulting endgame. I sure as hell try. <laughs> yeah. It's like the one flew over the cuckoo's nest quote. But I, but I, I think, but I tried, God damn it. This, by the way, is a tactical concept that you should all be familiar with, just the notion of taking on h7. And when I say this from white's perspective, obviously this also applies for black, like bishop takes h2. You force the king onto a vulnerable, a checkable square, and then you move your queen to some square where it forks another piece that's often on the other side of the board, in this case, on in the center on d7. Okay, we can pre-move queen d7. We're not going to. We have plenty of time. Actually disabled pre-moves. Yeah, this is a grind. This this game, I was expecting, to be honest, that our opening would just yield a crushing attack, but no. We're going to have to grind it out in an endgame. Against Mr. Ayoi. Okay. Yeah. Well, our opponent is thinking. And... He's doing a great job, honestly, but by thinking in this position. I think a lot of people with black would just automatically take on d7. And probably that is the best move. But there is an alternative. And our opponent does play the alternative. Queen c7 to b6. He decides to keep the queens on the board. And our queen may look like the strongest piece, but in fact it is our most vulnerable piece. Because if black plays on the next move, the move bishop b7 to d5. Our queen is locked on black side of the board, and then rook to a7 will trap the queen. So we need to move our queen back, and we need to do it such that the f2 pawn is protected. So our, our only move here is to drop the queen back to d2. We are not afraid of bishop takes f3. Why are we not afraid of it? Because white, black has no pieces left. This is a very common mistake. I mean, I think most people under 1500 would probably take on f3 here. I think that would be a very serious mistake because we are still up a pawn. And in fact, as a result of this trade, the g-file opens. Who stands to benefit from that? Well, we have the classic idea of moving the king into the corner and then playing rook g1 and orchestrating a furious attack against black's king. So the less minor pieces there are, the less, you know, the less important these structural damages are because black has no pieces with which to attack white's king. There's no knight to stick on h4 like we did in the, in, the, in the last game, the Rosalimo game. Okay, f6. So this forces our bishop to make a decision, and make a decision we will. I think the decision is quite obvious. Our overarching strategy here with white, what should it be? Well, it should be to simplify, right? We are up a pawn, so simplification is to our liking, especially when we can trade one of black's good pieces. And so... Uh, kind of a no-brainer type of move. Here's bishop back to e3. 
And simplification is much more important than preserving like the cosmetic purity of our pawn structure. You might say, oh, well, after bishop takes e3, queen takes e3, after the trade, well, we have an isolated pawn. I don't care about that. In an endgame, isolated pawns aren't bad at all because they often can't be attacked. And we're going to automatically take with the queen here. Trades are good. Also, I kind of want to play an endgame so I can... We haven't had a lot of endgames, so I really want to be able to talk about endgame conversion. We will have to play a little bit faster. Our opponent keeps queens on the board, and this is obviously not an easy conversion task. So, okay. Obviously, the, the annoying bit about converting this consists in Black's peace activity. Black has this battery... And it's aiming at our knight, and otherwise we would obviously play the move knight to d4. God forbid, don't play that now. You get mated on g2. So our rook for the time being is... Or sorry, our knight for the time being is somewhat immobilized. Not totally immobilized. If necessary, we can drop the knight back to e1 and perhaps push our pawn out to f3 and try to blunt black spatter. In fact, I think that's a great positional idea to play knight e1 and then f3. And the knight can circle back around into the center with knight to d3. But that competes quite strongly with an alternative. There is only one open file. You know what to do when there's only one open file. You want to be the one to control it. So the alternative to me is to play the move rook to d2 and to stack the rooks on the d file. But I want us to solve immediately the main problem in our position, which, of course, is the fact that the knight can't really participate in society. And from a psychological standpoint, it's always unpleasant to your opponent when you are, are sort of constantly reacting to your opponent's main ideas right he's putting his eggs in this basket and we're trying to you know break the basket with a move f3 now why are we not afraid of playing f3 again black has no dark squared bishop if there was a dark squared bishop sitting on e7 it would be unthinkable to play f3 because bishop c5 would win the queen with no dark squared bishop we can very safely play the move f3 and i'm not worried our queen is protecting this diagonal we're not moving our queen anytime soon yeah, great play by our opponent. This is a super high-level game. Black should probably take the open file with rook a to d8. And remember the piece threshold rule. When you are up a piece or more, simplification becomes essentially your top priority in the sense that it often is worth to make some concessions in the name of simplification. But when you are up two pawns or one pawn, simplification is often good but not good to the point where you want to simplify at the cost of making those same concessions. So after rook a d8, a common mistake would be to take that rook and say, well, I'm training rooks, I'm making progress. But it's not worth giving up the only open file just to trade a pair of rooks. Hopefully that makes high level sense. Rook takes d8, rook takes d8. Our pieces are not active enough to sustain another you know, major weakness or major artery. So after rook a to d8, what I like is just to continue our re-shuffling re with knight e1 to d3. There's a very juicy square that I've already noticed, and that's the c5 square. Imagine putting a knight on c5 and then perhaps supporting it with the move b4. That's a very nice outpost. And then we can slowly start working on getting control of the d-file. Okay, rook fd8. Well... I don't see a reason for us to take long on this move. Let's go knight to d3. An alternative would be to play this move rook to d3, trying to combine two ideas in one, where you're going for the old idea of doubling rooks, but you're also trying to trade on your own terms. Should black take the rook, you're going to take back with a knight and continue the other maneuver. But this is a little bit too subtle for me. Let's go knight d3. Well, no. I like knight e1 because of the f3 concept, but I also like as a bonus that the knight is c5. The best move for black would probably be to play rook a to c8, but that's... And he plays it. Okay. Well, the fight continues. Hmm. All right. So, again, I see a couple of options for us. One option is to play a move like h4, and try to run this pawn up to h6 and soften up black's pawn chain. That's one option. But I want to... See, no, but b4 blunders the... A lot of you are suggesting b4 forgetting that the c3 pawn will be hanging. So I like the idea of playing b4, but we need to prepare it. And we often... Moves should be prepared 
directly, right? The, the way to prepare B4 is not going to win you any beauty prizes or brilliancy prizes, but some moves like this can be the most annoying to face and the most effective. Rook A to C1. Well, we don't need to defend the C3 pawn, but we will if we play B4. And once we get the knight to C5, we will thank ourselves for playing this preparatory move. The rook is complaining. It's like, do I really need to be doing this? Yes, you do. <laughs> and it's also not committal. And what I like about this move is it's totally non-committal. If black does something and we need to change our plans, no worries, we put a rook on C1. That doesn't harm our position in any way. A good alternative to this move would have been to drop the knight back to F2 and start getting rooks off the board. But I want us to at least torture our opponent with the prospect of going B4. Is E4 not dangerous? Well, if you actually calculate it, E4, we play F takes E4. What's the problem? I don't get what the problem is about the move E4. I mean, if black takes with the queen, ab absolutely trade all the pieces. This is good for us. You know, big deal. The knight will be hanging at the end of the line. We have plenty of squares for the knight. We can move it to F4. We could move it maybe to B4. So, yeah, the bishop has more air true, but you're not going to prevent everything, right? Remember that we are up a pawn. So all things held equal, trades are good for us even if they come with a small price tag. Rook to d6, another great move of our opponent. And this is a great move because in the event of b4, black now doubles rooks on the d file, and we just aren't in time to play knight c5 because the rook on d1 hangs. Well, I think that the outline, the scenario that I outlined has come to fruition where we need to change our plans at the drop of a hat we will no longer be able to play B4 in like a good version. So we have a couple of options in lieu of that. We can play Knight F2, right? That old idea. But I don't think we need to open up the D file immediately. I think it would make sense for us to double Rooks on the D file and then move the Knight away from D3. Okay. Uh, so let's go Rook D2. I'm anticipating Rook C to D8. Then we will play rook c to d1. And at that point, the tension will have reached kind of an apex. And presumably, we will then want to move the knight away from d3 and get all four rooks off the board in such a way that we don't also like blunder a pawn or run into some fork or allow some attack. So, okay, our opponent taking, taking his time. Yep, okay, well, rook c d1, we can play quickly. Now, notice something. Well, okay, let's wait for the move. Let's wait for the move. What is our next move likely to be? Well, unless black does something, probably the best move here is queen c4. I mean, that's a very, very high level move. That's a very high level move because it, okay. Well, what's interesting is that's actually a blunder. Um, I did that deliberately. It is a blunder. It is a, it is a good move from a, positional standpoint but it is a blunder tactically how do i know that it's a blunder this doesn't mean anything by the way there is i let's not fall prey to confirmation bias there, there is a chance our opponent was listening but there's also a chance that he came up with this independently why is it a blunder well anytime you've got pieces staring at each other on an open file through the lens of another piece right that is a discovered attack waiting to be played right when there's a knight on d3 like this we control the lever, right? We can move the knight whenever we want to. And what I'm seeing is that the move queen c4 relinquishes black's defense on the d6 rook. It is now a type 2 undefended piece. It's only protected by one other piece. And it is stared at by two other pieces. Both rooks are staring at the rook on d6. All of this should lead you to the very pretty tactic knight takes e5. The reason we needed the black queen to move away from c6 was that with the queen on c6, knight takes c5, black would just recapture, and he would have sufficient defenders on the rook. Now, very important detail. What do we do if black takes the rook on d2? Well, what do we do? And you might get excited and grab the queen here. That would be a grave error, because black takes the rook on d1. Queen disease is what I call it. And then black takes the knight on c4, and black has a kingdom and a horse for the queen. Black has... Two rooks and a bishop. That's way too much material. So obviously, you should play rook takes d2. And here's the second important bit. If the black rook on d8 were defended, 
Let's say the bishop was in on b7, it was on e7. This whole procedure would not work. Because in this position, black would take on e5. And that's it, the rook would be defended. So when I was taking on e5, it was critical not only that the rook on d6 was unprotected, but that its counterpart on d8 was also undefended. Now, there were a lot of moving parts to account for here. The game is not over. Black loses a second pawn. At this point, it's just a matter of converting carefully, but we still have a lot of work to do. Okay. There's a lot of nuance to these tactical operations and ideas, and when you see a tactic like this, it's important to realize like what are the underlying themes that's what allows you to find moves like this during the game. And what's easy to miss about it? Okay, so here, clearly, we should take the low-hanging fruit, and we should trade rooks. And now our knight is hanging. We should decide where to put it. Knight to g6 would be a blunder. That would blunder the knight. One of the most common types of blunders in, you know, queen and knight versus queen and bishop positions is, of course, blundering your extra, your minor piece. Knight g6 puts the knight on a super vulnerable square. And after queen to d1 check, black steps back to c2, forking the king and the knight. That's the best way to lose. So let's keep it safe and keep it tight and play knight d3. And you want to keep it very defensive, especially if you're low on time. You want to make sure that your pieces protect each other. And we have an extra pawn on both sides of the board. So how are we actually going to win this? Well, we're going to trade queens if we have the opportunity to do so. We're not going to try to force it. We're certainly not going to sacrifice a pawn in order to trade queens. But if a good opportunity presents itself, we will jump at it. Generally, assuming the queens are going to stay on the board, our strategy is to just create a passed pawn and push it. Right? That's the stock winning plan in so many different types of endgames. And just because there are queens on the board doesn't mean it's an exception to the rule. So what's the easiest passed pawn to create? Well, if you look at both sides of the board carefully... There is a passed pawn that's waiting to be created. We start with the move b3, and then we push the pawn through to c4. Not immediately, but we use our queen to pry the black queen off of d5 and to prepare c4. That's, that's step one. Step one is to play the move c4. We should also consider bringing the king up to f2, where it's a little bit safer. It's not subject to back rank checks, but let's not jump the gun. Let's wait for black's move. King f8. Well, and that loses on the spot. We made a mental note to ourselves. If we get a queen trade opportunity in a good set of circumstances, we do it because it's just easier to win this end game with no queens. And we just did, right? When you make these mental notes to yourself, you're just far more likely to see opportunities when they arise. There's the trade of queens. Okay, so here the win is very straightforward. Our general plan has not changed. We will still create a pass pawn and promote it and maybe even create another one on the other side of the board. But with the Queens off the board, it has become more important to be patient, right? Rather than playing C4 immediately, let's begin by bringing our King all the way up to the center. And there is a sort of ticking clock here figuratively because we don't want to allow Black's King to get overly active, right? We want to bring our King up to D4 uh, in a way that restricts the activity of its counterpart. And that's why there's no time to waste. We go king f2 straight away. Oh, we had a very nice move there, actually. Let me think about this for a second. We, <laughs> there's a cool idea in lieu of this, but we're going to play it simple. And now, of course, king to d4. Anytime you have a situation like this where your king defends a minor piece, be very careful that your opponent can't use a pawn to dislodge your king. I see blunders like this all the time. If black had a pawn on e7 right now, black would have the move e5 check, and we would lose our knight. Okay, black is collapsing. Obviously, that's another blunder. Now we're three pawns up, and there's no reason that we need to give up any of our pawns. A nice way to defend it, an elegant way to defend it, is to bring the knight back to b4, and that's it. We create a pass pawn. We can play a4. We can play c4. Black resigns. Nice game. That was very nice. Okay, I lost my lid to the iced tea. Okay, let's go over it quickly. I'm going to bring out the Alpen Bible.
So I can give you a little bit of context on the theory here. So Okay. So e5 transposes to the advanced French. And if you are an advanced French player, then by all means, you can avoid a lot of theory by playing e5, or you can transition it into theory you already know. But I am gearing this toward people who don't play the advanced French. And I keep saying, what is the advanced French? Well, that's the French is e6, and the advanced variation is e5, which I do recommend, by the way. But after c5, as you may know, I recommend the Nimzovich variation, which is knight g1 to f3. And I've had plenty of speedrun games that go that have went like this if you play the main move c3 then this is indeed the advanced french it's the same exact position as after 4e5 in the alp and i'm clicking actually at these two different spots and as you can see the position is not changing okay so the the alpine-esque move is e takes d5 and here black has a fork in the road let's take a quick look at e takes d5 i'm going to give you a little bit of context here for how uh, Kalifman recommends that white should play. It's page 128. And of course I know, but I, I want to confirm. Okay. So why is it likely that this reaches an isolated queen pawn structure? Well, the reason is because white can reach the IQP structure anytime they want. We can play D takes C5. And after bishop takes e5, there is an isolated queen pawn on d5. Now, in the Alapin, you often play with the isolated queen pawn. Here you are playing against it. And the great thing about the pawn on c3 is that it controls the square in front of the pawn. So, yes, the knight can't move out to c3, but the pawn is actually a great asset here because it keeps the pawn confined on d5. But you don't want to take on c5 straight away. You want to do it at a more opportune moment. Yeah, so you want to start by playing knight to f3. And here, most of the time, you get a little bit of development. Black has a couple of moves here uh, that I can show you. If black plays, um, if black plays c4. No, first of all, if black develops the dark squared bishop, who can tell me what we would do in this situation? Let's see who paid attention to something that I said during the game the moment black plays bishop to d6 or bishop to e7 now we take on c5 and we win a tempo we force the bishop to move twice and here we get a big development advantage we play bishop b5 check and already black is in some trouble um if black plays knight c6 then we transpose into a line that i'll show you through a different move order if black plays bishop d7 though we can already snap off the pawn on d5 queen takes d5 um, and after queen, well, if bishop takes b5, we play here and we're up a full pawn. Queen d3 is not dangerous because we have this check and black is getting massacred. So here there's the check on e7. It appears to win a piece because black defends the bishop, but the bishop can drop back to e2 and black has insufficient compensation for the pawn. Queen d1. Knight c6, castles. Black and castle queenside. This is the game Ginsburg against Rioja. Buenos Aires, 1993. Bishop d3. Black's pieces have been deployed actively, but he can hardly prove to have sufficient compensation for the pawn because white has no weaknesses in his position. It's like 0.6 here. Uh, so that's uh, what to do in the event that black moves. The dark skirt bishop. If black plays c4, then the response here is, of course, to play b3, cutting into this pawn. And if black plays b5, this you should already know from previous speedrun games. How do you keep attacking this pawn chain? Well, you play the typical move a4. And you want to do this quickly because if black plays a6, after a, b, black loses. Because the rook on a8 is unprotected. Right? Notice that if black's bishop was on b7, all of this would have worked out. So the main move here by far is knight to f6. Um... And here you give a nice little check on b5, developing with tempo. Pretty straightforward. And there's another fork in the road here. There's another fork in the road. There is the move knight to c6. And in the event of knight to c6, we castle. 
And you do the same thing. Eventually, black is going to have to develop his bishop out to e7. And th the moment that they do that, you take on c5. Then the other bishop comes out to g5. And this is a very unpleasant position for black. Because if black simply castles, well, of course, we take on f6. And black has zero compensation for the pawn. So black has to play a move like bishop to e6, which is quite passive. If black plays bishop back to e7, who can tell me where this knight ultimately belongs? That knight on b1, what is its ultimate destination square? It's b3. Yeah, we want the knight to b3. Why b3? Because again, we're ultimately heading for d4 to blockade the isolated queen pawn. And white is in fact dominating the square in front of the pawn. If black plays h6, we don't normally trade this bishop unless we win the d5 pawn. Okay, bishop g4, rook e1, rook e8, h3. And after bishop h5, black lost the pawn. Takes, takes. So you can see how often black is unable to keep the pawn protected. This is just one illustrative line. What else is there? So if black plays bishop to e6 in this position... Then white again does the same thing, knight b to d2, castles, knight to b3, bishop to b6, and knight b to d4. And white is slightly better. White is slightly better. I mean, rook to e1 is coming next. Califon gives the line, rook c8, rook e1, bishop to g4, bishop takes c6, and h3. And here you are transitioning the advantage from isolated queen pawn to an attack against black's king. Bishop h5, knight f5, threatening a fork on e7. King h8, rook e5. Bishop c7, rook e7. And the situation is very unpleasant for black. You can see how active this is. They give the line bishop g6. Bishop takes f6. If g f6, oh, beautiful. Queen d4. Bishop f5, queen f6. Knight g5. Look at this line. Now, what is white threatening in this position? White is threatening to take the bishop and mate on h7. Bishop g6, knight to e6, the showstopper. The showstopper. F e6, mate. It's over. Black has to give away. No, black can't even... Black just gets mated. Uh, so this is their main line, actually. How cool is that? So that's how dangerous these positions are for black. It's not just positional pressure. You can actually transform it into an attack. So the last thing I'd like to show is the main line, which, uh, is, which is knight to c6, bishop b5, and now bishop to d6. Largely, it's the same thing. Takes, takes, castles. Now, if knight f6, then, then bishop g5, and we get a very similar position to what we looked at. If knight e7... Then knight bd2, castles, and again, it's the same deal. Knight to b3, and white is slightly better. Bishop d6, they recommend bishop back to d3 in order to set up an attack on h7 and set a trap. If bishop g4, there is the classic bishop h7 and knight g5 picking up the bishop. So basically, white's idea in this line is to wait for black to develop his dark sword bishop and then take on c5, then reposition the knight to b3 and sometimes even to d4 and based on what black does either accumulate pieces in the center or bring the bishop back to d3 or as you saw in that first line develop a, a direct attack against black's king side there's so much more to talk about in this line but this is just a very basic a very basic rundown okay now we get to the game queen takes d5 so here after knight f3 knight f6 there are multiple possible moves i really like the move knight a3 um and if black plays c takes d4 then of course you go knight b5 and you know conceivably some games end like this this is just a fork but most people who look at this position for the first time with black they end up dropping the queen back and after queen takes d4 black is in huge trouble in this position why is black in huge trouble because if you look at this position, I mean, white's knights are ridiculously active. There's a fork threat on c7. The bishop is terrible. And white just has, like, an overwhelming initiative. The knight's coming into d6. 
And once the knight comes into d6, I mean, just look at this position that the light's dark squares, the king is stranded, it's like plus two already. And just because the queens are off the board does not mean that white doesn't have a furious initiative. He does. So in this position, black is best advised to play this move knight a6. But uh, after and b takes d4, still very unpleasant for black. I actually won a game here very recently. Um, I won a game here very, very recently with white. And it was a completely one-sided game. It was in the U.S. Open. It was in the U.S. Open. And I can show you. I was against the GM. And it wasn't even close. It was not even close. Oh, but it was a slightly different line. No, it was not. It was the same line. Nice. Now, black played a different move instead of C takes D4, but you'll get the point. It's much the same ideas. This is to show you that I do, in fact, practice what I preach. Okay, this is in the recent tournament that I played. Balaji is a GM. Okay. So, knight three. And Balaji plays knight c6. Bishop to e3. In this particular line, you don't want to rush knight b5. You actually want to go here first. You wait for cd, and now you go knight b5. Why? So that the knight can then recapture on d4 and have a nice escape route. So my opponent just kind of plays natural moves, but this type of position is just horrible for black because there's just no good way to develop the light squared bishop. And look at how nicely white's pieces are positioned. And my play is so natural. Knight e5, rook e1, takes, takes, queen f3, queen f4, x string, the rook on b8, knight t5, over to h4, bring the other rook into the game. Now black collapses. F6, knight back to g4. And already black's position is terrible, but he blunders with queen e7. Who can tell me how I finish the game in this very position? He resigns in two moves. Well, Balaji is American. I mean, he, he was born in the US. Knight takes h6. Very nice. LPDO. Lose pieces drop off. Queen g3. Bang. Goodbye, rook. Goodbye, knight. Game is over. Now, this is a slightly idealized game. He didn't play too well, but still, you know, this line of the elephant is incredibly dangerous for black. Yeah, just a disgusting game. One of my better elephant wins, actually. And I've beaten a couple GMs in the elephant, so it's a venomous opening at every level. Okay, so as we were discussing, CD, knight b5, knight a6, knight b takes d4, and... If black plays the move e5 here, it's very important to know what to do. Because if you're looking at this for the first time, you might say, oh, well, I have to move my knight, and then black can take the queen and force my king to move. No, no, no. You give a check, and after bishop d7, you play this classic move, queen e2, pinning the pawn and attacking the pawn. And in the event of takes takes, I mean, you can see how dangerous this is for black. The king is stranded, and if black plays e4, we don't have to react. We just castle. And then rook d1 is coming. I mean, the knight is a monster. It's unassailable. The knight on b5 is unassailable because when the knight comes out to a6, black can no longer play pawn a6. This, by the way, also is an idea in the Jababa London. Uh, in the Jababa London, you get a very similar concept where basically in certain variations, um, in certain variations, for example, let me think. What did Ortiz play against me? What did Ortiz play against me? In certain variations, okay, the bottom line is like you go, you go knight b5, and you get this monster knight on b5 because it can't be can't be attacked and it can be easily supported with a pawn. So just remember this construction. When the opponent's knight comes out to a6 or h6, you can put a knight on the square diagonal to it and it cannot be attacked by a pawn. So in, in the game, our opponent plays the correct move, a6. Um, you can see how dangerous c takes d4 is. Now we get the knight into c4, and queen d8 is a mistake. This is uh, clearly better for white. The only way for black to keep something resembling equality is nbd7. And here the move that Kalifman recommends is actually a4. And I think I've already analyzed this in a previous speedrun game. White is slightly better. I think we'll get another chance probably to play this exact line. So... Here I would like to stick to what our opponent played and 
really talk about the continuation of the game because among club players, I think queen d8 is going to be a more common move. Okay, so we get our bishop out to the most active square, to the square d3. Black develops. We develop. Black develops. And we took this opportunity to take on c5 and make black lose the tempo. Now we play the move queen e2, creating space for the rook to move into d1. Knight bd7. And I actually think that rook d1 was uh, not the best way to play. I think given how the game continued, I think it would have been a better idea, a more prudent idea, to, at this point, either prevent b5 with a4. I think this would have been a good moment to do it. Because, of course, black can play b6. And now, most importantly, get this bishop out to f4. I feel like bishop f4 would have been a more unpleasant move because it deprives the queen of the c7 square. And in the game, I kind of underestimated the impact of black bringing the queen to c7. Of course, if black plays b5 here, we can do the same thing we did in the game and move the knight to e5. But if you think about it, after bishop b7, rook a to d1, the black queen doesn't have the c7 square anymore, obviously. We just play knight takes d7. If queen takes bishop, then we take the other bishop. And here you have the classic discovery on h7. So I think with or without a4, we should have developed the bishop to f4 rather than g5. In the game we played rook d1, we allowed the queen to occupy the square. Still, maybe a4 would have been better. Because b5 is, is a rather good idea for black. So we played here, b5, here, here. But I can see that we actually all play the engine moves. Knight d7, knight d7, and we cash in our advantage with bishop takes h7, check. Check, takes, and according to the engine, it is a 0.3.4 advantage for white. So black should be able to hold the draw, but black is not having any fun here. And I think we won the game very smoothly. F6 might be a slight inaccuracy because it weakens the kingside pawns. How would I defend this for black? I would probably play a move like B4 and try to orchestrate some queenside counterplay. But still, after takes, takes, queen e2, white is up a pawn. And we're controlling the d8 square. And, um, you know, white has, I think, pretty decent chances to convert. You can analyze a position like this with an engine if you want to learn more about these types of structures, but I'm getting exhausted. So we're going to move to the end of the game here. Um, we trade according to the computer. Yeah. Queen C six is the best move. And now 91. I really, really like, I think 91 is a very important motif to move the knight away and then bring a pawn up in order to blunt, uh, your opponent's battery, right? That's how you want to generalize this idea. You move the knight away and then the knight is replaced by a pawn. And the purpose of that pawn is to create, you know, a situation where your opponent bites on granite. Um, I had a game against Carlson, actually, in aim chess where I did something similar. But I can't find it right now. I think you get the point, though. I think you get the point of the move 91. Um, e5. We play f3. We cut into the, the battery, and then we bring our knight into the game with knight d3. And of course, if black had made some random move, we would have played knight to c5 and supported the knight with the move b4. But our opponent was not that cooperative. He played rook ac8. Now we go rook ac1 again. We're trying to go b4, knight c5. And still, our opponent does not cooperate. Now, what's interesting, I had to refresh because I was disconnected. What's interesting about this situation is that the engine actually believes that black's best chance to make a draw would have been to play e4. And as a result of the trade, it's a position where the bishop is very active and the knight doesn't have a lot of good squares. And black's pawn structure is pretty healthy. So I would say that it's maybe a 50-50 position, 50% 50 chance of white winning, 50% chance of a draw. Um, but probably this was the, the best bet for black. The way he played... Um, it allowed us to, to double rooks on the d-file. And still, the last chance for black would have been to actually play a very smart move. Queen back to d7 would have given us some trouble. 
because if we move our knight away, then black wins with rook takes d2. And it's important to realize that just because you win the queen doesn't mean you win the game. In fact, here, you obviously lose the game because you lose a lot of pieces. So if I were playing black, I would go queen back to d7 and try to tie down this knight, prevent the knight from moving away. Now, we would have probably brought our king to the rescue with king f2 and king e2. Maybe this. And the moment the queen moves away, we drop our knight into c5. So here, our plan would have been to bring the king to e2 and free up the knight and try to force as many trades as possible. I think black is in huge trouble here anyway, but our opponent hastened the process with queen to c4. Knight takes e5. Hopefully this move makes sense. Obviously, if he takes the knight, we take twice and we're up in exchange. No, no back rank shenanigans. Um, and it's important just to reiterate that the rook on d8 is undefended. Otherwise, black would have taken. And here it's important that we're able to take the rook with check. It's also important that after here, here, our king has luft. Imagine upon being on f2, rook d1 would have been checkmate. So what I'm trying to say is that these complicated tactics are always contingent on certain things being the way they are about the position. You can never take those things for granted. That's why it's so important to make observations. Say, oh, well, one positive byproduct of the move f3 is that I have a, a square for my king. I don't have to worry about back rank problems. Um... Yeah, maybe black could have also tried e4 here. Uh, but then knight b4 is a very important move. You do not want to take on e4. Because suddenly you dig yourself into a hole and the knight is lost here. You need to keep your queen on e3. And here you go knight b4. And then you trade everything. And then you win a second pawn. So here, this is bad for black. Conorab asks, why rook fd1 instead of rook ad1? Um, well, that was a while ago. Let me rewind all the way back. The reason we played rook fd1, well, no, we played rook d1 because it was the only rook that could move to d1 at that point. Now, maybe you're asking about a later point in the game. No, there was no point at which we had a choice of rooks to put on a square. I actually took the question seriously. I forgot that we didn't have that choice. But it's a good question in general. So... In any case, after queen c4, we take a second pawn. We trade all the rooks. We move our knight back. And if black had not allowed the trade of queens, then we would have won the game by playing a move like queen to d4. The trade is easy. And if black moves, we would have gone king f2 to stop queen e2. And then we would have gone c4 and c5. And ultimately, we would have promoted our pawn. We don't even really need our pawn majority on the other side of the board. Um, so... Again, if you want more practice converting advantages, one thing you can always do is you can set up a position like this at home and play it against the computer. I actually highly recommend it. Uh, if you want to be super diligent, analyze this position with the computer, see how the engine converts the advantage. I mean, that's how you learn, right? That's how you learn certain types of conversions. It's not everything is available on YouTube or in a book. You need to get a feel for how to do certain things in chess. And the best way to, to get a feel for stuff is to play it out and to make mistakes. But after black allowed the queen trade, everything was very easy. Of course, he blunders a second, a third pawn. But if he didn't do that, we would have gone c4. And again, the win is very easy. So thank you all. For those new to my stream, I have a YouTube channel. We're slowly building toward 400,000 subs. So every sub counts, and I appreciate it, allowing me to do what I love and what I think I'm meant to do. Bye.